welcome Srijit. Uh, Srijit Chakravarti is currently a principal engineer at Intel Corporation. His current responsibilities include die disaggregation and interconnect testing, silent data error, and functional safety. He's recognized leader in design for test silicon reliability and quality. He's published one book, authored over 130 papers in IEEE, uh, has 20 plus issued patents, and gradu graduated several doctor doctoral students, uh, served on various capacities at uh, numerous IEEE conferences, and delivered multiple keynote addresses. For his professional work, he has been recognized as an IEEE fellow. So please welcome Srijit. Thank you, guys. Uh... My, you know, as uh, firstly, uh, good morning to everybody on the West Coast in, in California and, and the United States, and afternoon and evening to others around the globe. Uh, I am going to talk about uh, specifically about the interconnect test challenges. Uh, many of the previous speakers talked about uh, how you test the individual dies, okay, as well as the interconnect. And uh, you know, one thing that is a uh, message that was coming across is that many of our CAD vendors think that uh, the problem has been adequately addressed with uh, what they have. Unfortunately, I sort of disagree with that. And I think, I hope at the end of this discussion, I will be able to convince all of you is that the problem is not solved. There are many issues to be resolved. And however, we, we are making progress, okay? So I'm not going to talk specifically about the solution. My intent here is to really present the problem. I think uh, that is what we need to uh, focus on. What are we trying to solve and what we need to solve coming for going forward, okay? And I hope uh, with the help of some data, I will be able to convince you of the complexity of the problem. So let me start by, you know, we have uh, at Intel, uh, we have had uh, multiple, and uh, we have been having experiences with many uh, chiplet uh, integrated products. Uh, the earliest one, uh, many of you will be, will may know, you know, in the, which was announced in the 2019 CES conference was a Lakefield product. It was a 3D die on die, uh, logic on logic uh, integrated device so we, across multiple processes. And, and it was of a you know, fairly small complexity in terms of what we are seeing today, but nonetheless, it was our first uh, product. Uh, there is a whole bunch, and actually Adam Wright spoke about this earlier, uh, in uh, where we build uh, complete products out of FPGAs, which are uh, integrated with other uh, specific ASICs like CERDES, accelerators, crypto engines, and things like that. And you know, one of the things that uh, there is a push for is the AI, AIB standard interface for that. So that's another example of uh, Intel products that are going out. Uh, the third one uh, kind of product uh, we really want to talk about is uh, there are these big RN compute products. And in that case, we have a combination of both 2.5D and 3D interconnect technology. Okay, and they tend to be very complex. Okay, you'll see that you know the base die could be multiple dies connected through what is shown as the EMIB, and then you could have base die uh, and, and other additional die stacked on top of each other. So you have both 2D, 3D uh, combined in this product. Okay, a good example, and I there's a reason for me to uh, present this is that is our point of view cure. Uh, this has this is out there in the market being used mostly in the high performance computing area, and the reason I bring this up is that you know it is a massive die. Uh, it is a massive product. It actually and the interesting thing out there is that it actually integrates uh, forty seven tiles or chiplets, if you will. Okay, uh, for some reason the word tiles and chiplets gets in uh, this thing. And the chiplets come from multiple process nodes, okay? Five as indicated there. And the interconnect technology in this case, what we are using is uh, what is uh, known as Foveris. This is Intel's term for the 3D packaging technology, okay? So. Now the uh, kind of uh, chiplet interconnect that we are talking about is really logic and logic die stacking. 
and you know uh, there is a you know this uh, these are data uh, these are images from published work where what we have is a face to face microbomb connection and i think it is important to keep that in mind okay where you know uh, you flip over and uh, place one die on top of the other and the two are interconnected using a microbomb solder that is shown on top there okay and if you look at uh, further down to the left okay uh, and as intel has previously mentioned that they, we started with 550 micron pitch and we are striving to go below 10 10 micron and below and then the io density is also per millimeter square is also uh, increasing drastically from a low 400 to upper, you know, our goal is to get past 10,000, okay? Now, if you look at uh, this uh, interconnect technology, you can model it as I, you know, as shown on the bottom right. Uh, so we am showing you a bottom die and a top die. And the signals are actually unidirectional signals. So on the bottom left, I show a signal going from the top die down to the bottom die. These are functional signals. So you have a transmit end and a receive end. And if you see that the signal goes uh, through a part of the top die into the micro bump and off into the bottom die. Okay. And similarly, you will have signals going from the bottom die to the top die. So you'll have a transmit end on the bottom die and a receive end on the uh, top die. It's, it's important to keep this uh, uh, picture in mind, cartoon in mind. Now the question is that what are we really testing? Okay, so if you look at that uh, picture that we had, if you look at the uh, transmit end. Okay, uh, logically this is one flip flop and a buffer uh, provided, you know, going through a diode here, uh, uh, and uh, the green line there is basically modeling the micro bump. Okay, and at the receiving end you have a bunch of buffers which is terminating into one. Uh, flip-flop. And then you could have other pipeline flops, other logic uh, to the left of F1 and the right of F2. Okay, And then there is a common clock. So if you look at this circuit by itself, we are really testing the interconnect from F1 to F2. And this circuit is fairly simple. Okay, So what is a great deal? Okay, And I think that this is that is what we may want to talk about Firstly, we talked about the density. So we really cannot probe any of these. Okay, so we definitely need no touch tests. There are a very large number of them uh, distributed all across the die to give you an idea in the pond to VQ that we talked about was you know, in the order of about 100,000 interconnects and, and the numbers are just growing. The other thing is very high density. So these tend to be in locations of the die where they are very uh, difficult to add any kind of area for DFT purposes. So we have to be very, very careful as to what kind of test support we provide. So the edge of the dies are very, uh, you know, are very uh, tight so far as area is concerned. The other important point, and which is, will be the central theme of this uh, presentation is that, that you know, typically when we talk about logic, we talk about single stuckard failures, we talk about uh, transition failures. Uh, those fault models are no longer valid for this interconnect. So there's much more complicated failure mechanisms that we have to talk about. And I will show you some data regarding that subsequently in the presentation. The other thing is that these are very complicated process steps okay, in order to build up this interconnect. So there is a fairly high failure rate and none of our products uh, will, will have adequate uh, yield uh, uh, output if you do not build in uh, uh, repair. Okay, so we will talk about that. So in a, fail, in a yield recovery and repair is a must. And then, then there is a host of challenges about fault isolation and debug. I'll, I'll touch upon this further on later on, and then a whole lot of laundry list. So the point of this file is that yes, the circuit is seems to be very simple if I model it this way, but uh, there are a whole host of issues that we need to add in order to be to adequately test and build up a robust product. Okay. 
So what is uh, important to understand in our discussion is that when we design, say I have 100,000 interconnects, okay? They're firstly in different clogs domain. So even if you have a, in a few thousand of them in a clock domain, we do not uh, have one common clock for all of them. So basically these interconnects are bunched into what we are calling, what I'm using the term cluster. And a cluster could be a small number of signals, okay? Could be anywhere, you know, typically in many of our designs, we see them to be about 36, 48, could be a little larger. It has a common clock because the two ends have to be uh, talking to each other with the synchronized clock. There are many ways to synchronize the clock across the uh, boundaries. So, so far as the test thing is concerned, we don't need to worry about that, okay? But the model would be that we have a bunch of wires along with the common clock that is synchronizing the transmit and receive it, okay? And, uh, the, and uh, if you have a large number of interconnects and your clusters are so small and you have to make small clusters because the clock has to be properly uh, uh, distributed to each of the flops in the interconnect. Okay? And that is what dictates how many uh, signals one clock source can manage. Okay? Now, inside the uh, cluster, there are a couple of things. Okay? We are. We have to support uh, repair. So when so in a, in as as shown in this picture, okay, if you have n signals that you want to uh, transmit from one from die one to die two, in addition to n interconnects, you will have to put in a few addition in in addition to n lanes that are connecting die one to die two. You'll have to put in some additional physical lanes, which are redundant lanes. So for example, if you want just one repair per cluster, the number of redundant lanes will be one. If you want multiple uh, repair per cluster, the number of redundant lanes will be two and so on, okay? Now, in, in addition to that, the clusters also contain all the uh, uh, way to store all the repair signatures, okay? So that they can be used during power up. There are repair marks that uh, are required within the clusters in order to you know, uh, pick up, uh, remove the faulty lane and be able to, uh, and then the finally, uh, there has to be some support for testing the clocks, okay? So that is where, how the whole thing looks like. You know, we don't need to get into the details, but that is what a cluster will evolve. So that will be a whole part of the DFT infrastructure. Okay, so now let us look at, uh, what causes uh, these interconnects to fail, okay? I show you a couple of X-ray images from one of our products. So let me walk you through them one by one from the uh, top left to the bottom right. On the top left, we see an, uh, what I'm showing as two bumps, okay? Which cause two uh, adjacent uh, signal lines to get uh, uh, shorted. Okay, uh, so that is uh, what we are calling is the isolated solder bridge bridging faults. This is a single uh, two lanes getting shorted. On the bottom left, okay, what I'm showing you is it, the solder bump bridging may not only involve two signals, it could involve multiple signals. Okay, so this is within a cluster and it could actually go across clusters. So. Uh, so it could be three, four, or more, okay. Yeah. okay. And then we have the uh, the thing on the top right, okay. Uh, we have uh, some foreign materials could uh, be deposited there. And as a result, imperfect contacts could be formed, okay. And then finally at the bottom left, uh, we have a misalignment, okay? Where a large number of uh, signals will be misaligned, okay? Because of the defect. Now let's walk through all of these, okay? The top left uh, is a candidate for repair, okay? The bottom left, the bottom left will involve many more uh, shots. So to some extent, we can repair them. If there are just too many, the overhead of repairing them will be too large, okay? Then we have the top uh, right, which is a uh, contact open. Even this can be uh, a candidate for repair, okay? 
And then the bottom one where there's a massive misalignment, okay, we really cannot repair them. Okay, so these are some of the things that we are seeing, uh, which we can uh, do failure analysis and take X-ray pictures and see them. Now, however, there is a limitation of what you can see in, in X-rays. We do not know if these are hard shots or, or uh, uh, resistive shots. Okay, and that that is important because hard shots can be de detected using slow speed tests, whereas the resistive ones need more at speed kind of tests. So that's one part of the story. The other part of the story is that X-rays or any kind of visual inspection of that kind does not uh, show us that there is some amount of coupling that is going on. These this, uh, interconnects run very close to each other. Okay. So what I showed down below here is one of our uh, spy simulation experiment that we did by, exp by extracting the spice model from an actual layout. And what is shown there is that we ran 20 uh, signals and then we essentially created a transition on one of them and, on, and tried to understand what is the coupling effect on all the other 90. And as you see that there is a significant amount of coupling going on, okay? So now two things are important here. This coupling will happen also during functional mode, okay? So we will have to account for it and if there are many such coupling, it might just, you know, and you're running these at very high speed. We are, we are talking about upwards of three gigahertz. Any such noise will push the uh, performance of this accra you know, and we will not be able to uh, run it at the proper speed, okay? Now, if you combine this with, uh, with any of those resistive defects, that only augments if these are added. Okay. So the point that we are saying is that, that we have to be very cognizant of what we are testing these interconnects for. It is not just stuck at uh, faults and not just uh, transition faults, okay? which is typically what we do okay, for other logic. Now, let me move. Okay. Now, the uh, thing that is... Uh, Let's uh, look at all of these, uh, try to put them in perspective, okay? Uh, so one of the things uh, uh, can be, uh, uh, what we see is that we see shots, right? Between two adjacent interconnects. Now, what if those two interconnects are carrying the VCC and the VSS uh, lines, right? So they will basically be a catastrophic failure because the power rails have got shorted. Okay. So one of the challenges there is that how do we avoid uh, okay, uh, this kind of failure mechanism to occur because the defect does not understand between VCC, VSS or signal wires. Okay. So these are the defects that we cannot address in high volume manufacturing. Okay. Or can it be? At least we do not know. If somebody has some bright ideas to address them, then that would be great. What uh, is typically done is that we work uh, uh, in the design space, okay? And impose uh, important design rules here so that we separate out these lines to the extent possible. Okay, so that's one, one, one part of it. The other defects that we talked about are actually targetable during high volume manufacturing. And so you will see shorts between signals and VCC and VSS. Okay, and approximately a third of the defects that we see fall in this category. And this is something that we can very easily and which can be modeled using the stuck at or the transition fault models. Okay, so, you know, so we are covered there using those models. When we get to two line signals, we see that is the, they are also quite significant, almost as significant as the short to VCC and ground. Okay, and about a third of the, of the defects fall in that category. Okay, now there are also many multiple line shots. Okay, they are not as prevalent as the two line shots, but still quite significant. Okay, and then finally, the opens tend to be very small in number. They are you know, about 5%. So this is really the kind of defects that we see. Now we are here talking about signal to signal. Okay. Yeah, and Thank you.
Sergi will be back in just a moment. So there sorry is. about that. <laughs> I just sorry, I mean, dog decided to <laughs> interrupt me. I'm sorry about that. No okay. worries. Okay. So, so that was the signal to signal we were talking about. Now, the other important thing that we have seen is that there's a lot of short between clocks and signals. That poses an uh, interesting thing. So typically in a design, we separate out the clocks from the signal in the layout, but the defects are such that even then we are seeing, you know, not a whole lot, but we are seeing uh, some of it. Remember, we cannot arbitrarily keep separating this out because these are highly dense areas of the design. Okay, so we, there is a, a trade-off that needs that. Then uh, the other interesting thing uh, is that, that you know, if we, if we talk about clusters, so we have a cluster of say 36 signals with a clock, another cluster with 36 signals and clock, they are not very far apart from each other. Okay, and we are seeing uh, signals across clusters also getting shorted. Okay, we also have to talk about various coupling failures. Okay, and as we say that, you know, uh, the X-ray based defect location uh, does not uh, reveal that, okay? So these will only fall out, you know, uh, show up in, uh, in uh, failure mode, okay? So. Okay, now let's move to the next file, okay. Now let's look at how the interconnect is uh, trending, okay? So what we talked about was what we say, one die on top of the other die. Right, we have a microbomb connection. Now, there are many uh, work uh, going on, not only at Intel, but outside of Intel, okay? Where multiple dies are being stacked one on top of the other, okay? So for example, in one scenario that I show here is that we have a die one, die two, and die three, okay? You have the microbomb connection between die one and die two, then you have the TSV and a direct metal to metal connection between die two and die three. Okay, so this is one scenario. There are various other scenarios that are possible. The only reason I put this up here is to uh, illustrate uh, how the complexity is in increasing. Okay, uh, so you you know, and we already talked about how the uh, you know the pitch is uh, decreasing. Okay, how the lane count is increasing and how the signal frequency is increasing. Now let's see from a defect perspective what is what does this bring to us. We talked about the microbomb defect in the previous uh, so far. So we have it on the uh, left side, okay? And on the right side, we have three dies being stacked on each other. Each of them have their own, uh, their own uh, failure modes, okay? We have the microbomb, okay? Then we have the TSVs. TSVs has their own failure modes, okay? And now imagine we have a large number of interconnects coming. So there'll be a large number of TSVs, okay? So one, one has to worry about the oxide shorts, the partially void opens that it could be created in this TSVs. And then you have the direct connection between the thing that will have its own uh, set of defects, which are the opens, uh, the foreign material shorts and so on. Okay. The interesting thing to remember here is that, that we can do a full test, okay? At the end when everything is assembled, but if you need more information, okay, at intermediate stage of stacking, then that's an interesting question to be asked, answered as to how do we do that, okay? Okay, so now let's see that now that we have, we understand what kind of uh, failure modes are happening, okay? And uh, one of the points that I wanted to make was that, you know, typically if you look in the IO world, uh, we, we tend to use, LF, you know, it is dominated by LFSR based tests, okay? Uh, what we are finding is that the LFSR based tests are not adequate, adequate and we need more deterministic tests. And what I show here on the top right is one such deterministic test. There might be other variants. What we I have showing you here is that if I have a couple of lanes, I will need a victim aggressor pair of tests, where in the first phase, we have the lane one as victim and all the other ones are the uh, aggressors. So they're toggling the, the test in an uh, opposite direction. Next, we are going to make uh, lane two a victim and everyone the aggressor and so on, okay? So in a, and you know we don't need to go through this table uh, in details. What really this shows is that 
that if we use LFSR based tests, there are quite a bit of defects we will be uh, missing. Whereas if you use more deterministic tests, you are going to be able to cover for this defect. So for our thing is developing the solution is that we are going with the deterministic test approach, okay? And our intent is to be able to cover, as you know, we, we are trying to cover all our bases using this kind of test. Okay, now this is so far as, you know, at high level, what the problem is. The problem with an interconnect test and DFT for interconnect is that it is not only a pass fail kind of a test, okay? For a comprehensive solution to test these interconnects, we need a couple of different uh, features. For example, you know, this could be single data versus double data rates. We, as I, I already spoke to you about, you know, we will have uh, uh, to perform repair at the cluster level, whether it is one repair, two repair, and at some point, the number of repairs you will perform in per cluster will start uh, adding too much uh, overhead. So we'll, you know, you might have to make a trade of that as to the uh, yield recovery and the area overhead. The other important thing, which is often missed in our discussion is that, that yes, we can use various techniques to do uh, failure analysis of die on the tester and figure out what is the repair. But in our case, we cannot afford to do that. For example, in the Ponte Vicchio example, I'll give you, there are about 2000 clusters and each of them has to go through the test and repair analysis. So we do not uh, prefer uh, uh, AT best based uh, test and repair. Okay, what we are doing is that our solution uses an on die test and repair. This is very analogous to what is in the uh, uh, memory test world uh, referred to as uh, Bizer and Byra. Okay, obviously we will need slow and at speed non destructive diagnosis capability. Okay, we not we have to identify which lane has failed. Okay, then we try to repair it. If it does not, then we have to say which die and which connect, the interconnect it has failed. The other thing is that we are being asked uh, by our uh, customers that they would like hooks to be able to perform system level tests of this interconnect. That means they would like a power on self test for these interconnects, okay, once they have assembled this into their system. So far as the clocking is concerned, okay, there are many things that are being asked for, okay. Uh, the only couple of things that I would point out is that, you know, they, we have been asked by our products to put in any kind of interlane skew measurements, the clock duty cycle modification uh, capabilities, the clock repair, and both uh, look at synchronous and asynchronous clocking. The other thing, that, the final point that I'll make here is that, that you know, the these are basically going into our large systems, okay? And, uh, what, and an important thing in, 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 our, in the system is that they have to run, in, run for uninterrupted for a very long uh, number of hours or days or months, okay? And you know, if you look at the automotive, you know, uh, it has to be fail safe system. So infill test and repair of these interconnects is coming into play. So whenever, so, the reason I list all of this thing is that, that uh, from a roadmap point of view, okay, when we consider test of these interconnects, we have to kind of keep all of these things in mind, okay? It is not just a HVM pass fail test, okay? But it, it does involve a lot more, okay? And I'm not going to here talk about the actual solution, but what I'm basically saying is that, and I think um, many of, uh, of the previous speaker has pointed this out, that there is need to be a standard. But I also get a sense that uh, the industry as such thinks that the IEEE 1838 has adequately addressed this problem. I tend to disagree with that uh, because I think we are more holistic uh, view of the test solution needs to be looked at. And then we need to know either we need to augment 1838 or have a new standard. I don't know what the right approach is, but I think for the sake of interoperability, I think we need to look at a very comprehensive solution. Okay. And I will end my presentation with that. Thank you. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer it. Yes, Yeah. All right, we got a couple, uh, maybe a room for a question or two. 
Um, so one of them is, you know, as transistor technology continues to scale, you know, to smaller and smaller geometries, uh, as well as, you know, the, the data die interconnects also continue to scale. You know, as, as you look forward, are you expecting more VCC VSS shorts, you know, at the, uh, you know, transistor level, or maybe the die to die level will start to dominate? Well, you know, it depends on how much power rails you're uh, using to, uh, how many of these interconnects are using to transfer data, uh, sorry, power. I think that is really the thing and how many power such uh, interconnects you need. Uh, I have seen numbers where that is quite significant in our earlier products, but then, as I mentioned, yeah, the people are looking at design rules and carefully laying them out so that, you know, the the chips don't fail just you know because there's a power shortage right the power rails have shorted so right, right. Hmm. okay and i guess another question um do we need specific clock and in, you know integrity tests and how do you test clock issues uh, so today yeah so basically what happens here is that firstly uh, what i am hearing from our product team is that they would like clock redundancy that means if you look at one cluster, you know, you, know, you have one uh, interconnect that is uh, transferring the uh, clock from the transmit to the receive site, okay? What is uh, being asked is that, that we put in redundant lanes for the clock. So that's one part of the story. The other thing is that uh, they need some amount of uh, uh, DFT help uh, to trim the clock network, okay? So that the two ends can be uh, synchronize and you know people are trying to put in delay buffers to skew the clocks and you know adjust the duty cycles also so those kinds of things are already being asked for okay. and and for two reasons one is that you know when they do it uh, pre-silicon they cannot guarantee that all of these things you know there is there is some concern and they would like to characterize it and program and trim these buffers okay uh, in silicon okay in order to be able to yeah so that is a challenge there too, yeah. Very good. Uh, one other quick question. How effective is self-repair in redundancy to maximize yield, especially with the multi, multi-chip multi structures that we have as we get a higher and higher order MCP? I do not know how, what will be the story in the, when we get three or more die stacking. Hmm. In the two die stacking, we are still able to do most of the repair by by using uh, at most uh, one redundant uh, lane, okay? Mm -hmm. And it is becoming more clear that we will have to add two. Now, you know, we are probably not getting all the repair that can be done within that. As I mentioned, the overhead for repair is also quite large. It doesn't matter how you do it, so, yeah. Yeah. Is ESD a concern as well on this? Uh, I have been told and no, I have been told no, uh, but I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. I think we're right at the top of the hour, Ira. Okay. Thank you, Sujit. I want to thank our sponsors once again, who made this event uh, possible and free of charge for everyone. So, uh, Thank you to the sponsors. And if you have an opportunity to thank them when you are in contact with them, it is greatly appreciated so that they will continue to sponsor events. Uh, walking through the sponsors, uh, first and foremost is our diamond sponsor, Omcor, with their uh, differentiators in technology, quality, and service. And in the Emerald sponsors, we have Adventist, um, with the highest rankings from VLSI Research and a synopsis, a silicon to software. We'd also like to thank our Ruby sponsor, Tech Search International. And most importantly, we'd like to thank all of you for attending today. And I look forward to uh, having everybody back uh, tomorrow. So thank you and have a good rest of your day.